Hello and welcome back to the KECC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we're jumping into some malicious compliance. Our first story today comes to us from Kabuki Coyote. Sell the box? Okay, no problem. Let's jump right in. My dad was a very interesting man with interesting collections. He was quite wealthy and he had the money to buy his bizarre oddities. They actually were fun to look at, an authentic suit of armor, old Greek coins from 500 BC, ancient jewelry, etc. He remarried after my sisters and I were adults, and we all pretty much hated the woman he married. It was so obvious why she wanted to marry him, it was for his money. My dad was an extremely intelligent businessman, so I never really understood why he married her. I guess I just assumed he was in lust with her, I just never knew for sure. I did ask him one day why he asked her to marry him. He explained he didn't, she asked him. Again, I asked, why did you agree? His answer was that he couldn't think of a reason not to. Okay, dad, whatever. Consider this, on her wedding day, she was beyond thrilled. Not because she was marrying my dad, but because all five of her creepy sons happened to be out of prison at the same time. When he died, the first thing Pat did was go through all these oddities, she picked out items she knew were of great value and, of course, kept them instead of including them in the estate per the will. It seemed like she was in court constantly over that will, the properties, etc. I lived out of state and just losing my dad, I wanted no part in the legal battles and drama. I just couldn't. I didn't want to be a part of it, so I hired a lawyer and just asked him to handle it and tell me when it was over. I really couldn't cope with all this. I was sick of it. My dad and I were very close, and it took me a long time to get over the loss of my dad. I just didn't deal with it well, and the thought of what she was doing to all his possessions, it was more than I could deal with at the time. He really loved and enjoyed those items. I was living out of state, and about a year after his death, I went home to see my sister and some friends. Pat knew I was home, and she was aware I knew how to use eBay. She did not. She called me and asked if I could eBay some items. For real? She wanted me to help her with these tasks? Sure, I guess. I went over to the house more because I wanted to see my childhood home one last time. She was notorious for putting everything in writing. She didn't want to speak to us, so she would write notes instead. She left the box on the front doorstep with a note asking me to sell this box on eBay. In the box were these ancient coins, ancient jewelry, etc. They did appear a bit beat up, and I realized she didn't understand that these items were authentic. They weren't replicas, they weren't fake, they were the real deal. I laughed to myself and thought, no problem Pat, consider it done. On eBay, they have a bit of a scam place where you can sell mystery boxes. You don't tell what is in the box. It might be rocks or it might be a treasure. She did say to sell the box, and she did say she wanted it done on eBay. So I listed the box, I was honest. I referred to the request of the step skank and said she wanted me to sell the box. There is another offshoot of eBay where they list odd eBay auctions and bizarre items for sale. My auction made that website, but nobody realized that what was in the box was legit. It was real. It was worth a great deal of money. I ended up selling the box, I think, for $44 and change. I sent the original box with all the items listed carefully. I had to. I knew she would take me to court over it eventually, so I had to be careful to document everything and I insured it for several thousand dollars. I can't remember the exact number now. USPS has a max for insurance. I think I insured it for 10,000, but I could be wrong. That was very likely the true worth. I dutifully sent Pat the check for $44 and change by certified check, return receipt requested. My stupid sister called her and told her what I had done and what the true worth of it was. Again, just as I knew, we went back to court and this was in her list of complaints to the judge. I told the judge the truth. I showed him her note. I proved I sent the box and he actually sided with me, as I honestly did not know the exact value of the items. She thought they were fakes. Who was I to disagree? About a week after I sent the box, the guy's father called me. He was very kind and very professional, but was concerned that I scammed his son. He explained that his son was mildly mentally challenged and I pretty well took all the money he had saved for this box of trinkets, and $44 was a lot of money to his son. He explained that he was aware I didn't know about his son, but would I object to refunding his money if he returned the items? I couldn't help but to laugh. I asked him if he still had the original box. He did. 
I asked him to really look at those items. They were not quite trinkets as he assumed. Then I explained the whole story. Then dad felt bad that I lost so much money and he actually offered to return them. Nope, I didn't want them back. It was truly icing on the cake for me. The box went to a guy who really didn't have much, but he does now. I couldn't have planned that ending better had I tried. The universe does work in mysterious ways. Well, OP, I think your dad would be pretty happy that all of those trinkets went to somebody who could really use them or could really benefit from the money from them in the long run. My devious mind got to thinking, though, because if this was me, I would have taken that box, listed it up on eBay, had a friend of mine buy it so that we could keep all the items, and then just sell them off and keep all the money. You'd still be able to show proof to stepmom that the items were sold, and you'd be profiting in the end. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Matt C. Sweet, old school construction architect with an ego. Let's jump right in. So this dates back to 1998. I had been working construction for a year as a drywall finisher, spreading mud, when I was offered a job on a big crew. Only reason they wanted me was to be a translator between English and French. I was good but not fast or great at this point, but hey, $18 an hour was good money. We were working on a five-story building. It was the first time I really had seen just the bones of a building. For those who are unfamiliar with this era of construction, I'm going to give a little background on how it worked on sites this big. Each company had their own construction trailer. No one really had email, so each trailer had a couple of phone lines and a secretary. This building was for a real estate company. It was to be their headquarters. It was designed by an architect in New York as a favor to the owner of the building. So here's where the problem goes. My boss, Al, had all the framing, hanging the drywall, finished the seams and acoustic ceiling, sealing tiles with metal grids. Al goes to the general contractor with an issue on the third floor training room. We got height problem with the third floor ceiling. What's wrong now? He's got it at four feet off the floor. Wait, what? Yeah, both ceiling reflected plan and elevation shows four feet off the finished floor. If I scale it, it would be 12 feet. Yeah, that don't sound right. Go ahead and send a request for information. Back then, requests for information were different than today. Usually meant someone was going to have to pay. So Al faxes over the request for information and marks it urgent. When the request for information comes back, they were sent to both the general contractor and the subcontractor. So I'm sitting with Al and the general contractor just chatting around, and both secretaries come out to the site, almost running with high heels through the debris, and both with crap-eating grins on their faces. I'm thinking, oh crap, this should be good. Slow down, ladies, where's the fire? You got an urgent fax. We got the request for information back. Looking at the other secretary giggling, they look at their paper, then look at me, and general contractor reads it out loud. Request for information number such and such from Office of Butthole Architect Incorporated. Urgent request information of discrepancy on ceiling height from Al Office about training room XXX. Answer, how hard is it for you construction workers to understand never scale anything? I don't make mistakes. Refer to page A804 for detailed height instructions. Q, malicious compliance. Well, Al, what does A804 say about ceiling heights? Four feet, bud. Hey, Frenchie, do you think you can translate that to the ceiling guys and tell them it's a hot priority? I want it done by Sunday. You heard him. Tell him to drop what he's doing and go to it. 10-4. I go to the guy and they greet me with a tabernacle, French Canadian cuss word. Are you nuts, kid? I tell them what had transpired and told them that Al said to make it four feet. They grumbled saying they would charge to do it again. Now, this training room wasn't your typical space. It was 300 feet long by 40 feet wide that could be separated to make multiple training rooms or one giant room with a folding partition. Monday comes, general contractor instructs the electrician to install all the lights as per prints. Yes, even his prints had four foot notation. Typically, we would wait for electrical inspection, but we didn't. By Wednesday, the crew is putting tiles in. Saturday comes and there's an owner meeting where he walks the job site with the general contractor and talks about progress. Everything is going good till he gets to the third floor training room door and sees a bar four feet from the ground and all the wires for the ceiling are in plain sight. What the hell is this? Don't you know how to read blueprints? 
Yes sir we do, and we did, we also sent an RFI, shows him the facts. Grins, yeah, he definitely has an ego from hell, do you have everything documented pictures and all? You know it. Okay smart butt, now do it at 12 feet, 4 feet from the deck, you're making 20% on this screw up aren't you? 20% to the build invoice, we're gonna have a demo crew come in, then all new material, plus the crew already said it's going to be 50% upcharge since we're preventing them from going to their next site. Yeah, just be happy it's not coming out of your pocket. Because the architect gave the wrong information and it was built as per his guidelines, he had to fork out a few thousand out of his pocket to us dumb construction workers to fix his mistake. Learned two valuable lessons that day. One, always do as you're told no matter if it makes sense, except when it endangers a life. Two, document everything no matter how trivial. It will cover your butt. Do you think this architect still goes around telling people I don't make mistakes? Or after paying to fix this, do you think they somehow were humbled a little bit and learned their lesson? What do you think? Comment down below. Our next story today comes to us from Dumpster Fire 15. My favorite military acronym is CYA. Let's jump right in. Background. Many thousands of years ago, before 9-11 and all the implemented security that went with that, I joined the local National Guard unit. After basic training and schooling in my field, I returned to my local base. In our school program, we were told that many times, the higher ranking soldiers would mess with us to see if we would do what they say. Now, not following a direct order is simply not done, and making large mistakes is also just not done. It was suggested that any time we were told to do something that was part of our job, we should write down what we were told, who told us, since everyone had the courtesy to wear their last names sewn to their uniform, this was easy enough, and what time and date we were told this. Now, I was raised in a fundamentalist religious cult and as a rebellious thinking female, I had long ago perfected the ability to look completely innocent and yet not crumble under the pressure of being admonished or even berated. On to the story. On my first day of duty after my schooling was finished, I started working in the police section of the base. I was told what was needed in order to process giving out car identification stickers and who got what color base identification strip based on their rank. I dutifully wrote all this out. Then, after my trainer, E3, moved on to help someone else with something, another service member came over and asked me what the E3 had told me. This service member was an E5 and worked on base full time doing what I was assigned on that weekend. The E5 said that the E3 had the colors wrong as they had just changed with the new presidential administration coming in and gave me the correct order. They left and I dutifully wrote down what was said, who said it and what time. The E5 had me giving lower enlisted members colors that went to commissioned officers. Soldiers at the gate must salute and allow them on base no questions asked giving commissioned officers colors that went to the lower enlisted members, soldiers at the gate, stop them, ask where they are going and why. That entire Saturday, I did as I was told by the E5 and was super smiley every time I gave out the requested stickers. I don't remember the exact number of stickers given out, but it was well in excess of 50. On Sunday, it all blew up. There were around 2,000 cars that went through the gate every morning of weekend duty all needing to be in at 0700 to be on time. The soldiers at the gate were saluting soldiers that underranked them and weren't saluting officers and were stopping them because of the sticker color. At 0715, I was called into the office of the major CO for the police section. Along with him was the non-commissioned officer and CO of the section and my E3 trainer. I took my trusty Steno pad and pen and went in. The trainer was asked what they had trained me to do and they answered. Then, the NCO, on a typical power trip, started yelling at me over making decisions instead of taking orders. After the NCO finished, the CO asked if I had made a decision instead of following orders. At that point, I then pulled out my Steno pad and read off that at 0930 on Saturday, E5 instructed me to hand out stickers in this order, as the colors had changed due to the new presidential administration. The NCO started screaming again about taking direct orders and not making decisions. After they finished their tirade, I asked the E3 if the E5 was in my chain of command. The E3 stated that they were. At that point, the CO thanked us, asked for us to get him a copy of the all sticker numbers and base identification stickers given out, 
and told us to go to the cafeteria and get some coffee and a Danish until he called for us. When we returned, the CO, NCO, and E5 were nowhere to be seen in the office, and so the E3 and I went about our jobs. As I was leaving the base to eat with some friends, I saw the NCO and E5 scraping off the stickers I had handed out while the CO stood there watching. Nothing was ever said to E3 or I about the incident again. Of course, being a military institution and having humans in the roles in the military, there were several more malicious compliance issues after that. Going back to the title CYA or cover your butt, well, that's in a lot of different places besides the military. In fact, I think I hear it more often in IT stories than anywhere else. Can you imagine how much CYA would be involved in military IT? <laughs> Our next story today comes to us from Boring Blackberry 580. Don't want to pay a union driver the extra hours at UPS? Let's jump right in. This happened years ago. I worked at a UPS, it was ran by a manager who was very quick in your orientation to let you know he was a former commander in Vietnam, and he ran this office just like he ran his troops in Vietnam. I was brought up to respect the military and didn't have a problem when I first heard this. The more time that went on, I felt sorry for the troops if he truly commanded any in Vietnam. It would be dead time in between when trucks needed to be unloaded and we would commonly just stand around and talk twiddling our thumbs when we were supposed to be cleaning. He would hide behind closed doors, sweating his butt off, looking out the small metal holes for hours at a time, trying to catch us like this. I couldn't help but just see how pointless this had to be as a manager's time to sit sweating for hours so you could catch employees taking a break in between a truck after really busting their butt for hours. The union covered all workers whether you joined the union or not. I didn't join, but I still enjoyed the benefits of the union, which included overtime if you worked more than four hours in the day if you are part-time. There will also be set rules such as if there was an overnight package delivery that was missed, and a driver had to drive it to the airport so the package would not be late, the manager had to pick one of the union employees to get that route. Due to the nature of them being part-time and normally just unloading boxes, it meant that they would be paid at a different driver rate over time, so one trip could get a nice boost of pay from one trip to the airport. This manager didn't like that and would commonly take these trips himself when he was supposed to let another driver that was union take these trips. Most of our overtime would come from the people who knew how to drive standards because at that point, you will automatically be volunteered to stay late after your shift to park these trucks for the next shift. Q malicious compliance. Anytime the manager stole these driving routes, everyone parking the trucks would go to turtle speed and a job that would normally take 10 to 20 minutes would suddenly take about the hour. So once he was getting back, everyone would be finished up as the trip to the airport and back took about an hour. One time, he must have had a side errand or something come up, I never found out why, but instead of one hour, the trip took about three hours. I just remember five or six young guys and a couple old guys walking around this lot pretending to look at our paper that showed where our trucks were and looking around dumbfounded as we turned a 10-minute job into a three-hour one. When he got back and saw us still in the lot, he just started screaming and everyone's trucks were parked within about three minutes and we all got the heck out of there. There wasn't much he could do to punish us since he was breaking the rules and he already did everything he could to make our lives there as tough as possible. That was the easiest three hours of overtime pay of my life for sure and my biggest team effort of malicious compliance. So the micromanager was out of the office and you took advantage of that to get yourself a little bit of a kickback? I say job well done. Check out all four OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.